Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome all of you to this IISS discussion uh, panel on the foreign policy implications of the Trident replacement debate. We all know that uh, defense and deterrence are at the heart of the Trident issue, but there are other policy issues that come into play. One of these is the degree to which Britain's role in the world is determined by its <coughs> membership in the nuclear club and the converse. Would the UK's status and influence be altered for better or worse by a decision to forego Trident replacement or to uh, maintain the deterrence option in some other format? Would the implications for foreign policy matter if the replacement were not on a like-for-like -like basis? In short, what is the interplay between British leadership in international politics and its status as a nuclear weapon state with continuous at-sea deterrence? At the suggestion of the British Pugwash WMD Awareness Program, we've invited some of Britain's leading thinkers and former statesmen to discuss the issue. And I'd like to uh, thank and acknowledge the role of that Carol Naughton uh, from Pugwash played in helping us plan this event. This event is on the record and it is being recorded, streamed live, and uh, available for later viewing um, after the event. Our panelists, as you know, are Sir Jeremy Greenstock, former UK Ambassador to the United Nations and Chairman of the UNA UK Board of Directors, among other positions. Lord uh, David Hannay, also former UK Ambassador to the United Nations and currently Joint Convener <coughs> of the All-Party Group on Global Security and Non-Proliferation, among other roles. Lord Gus O'Donnell, former Head of the British Civil Service and Cabinet Secretary, and now a visiting professor at two universities, among other roles. And Sir Richard Matram, former Permanent Undersecretary at the Ministry of Defense, and active in various private and public sector roles as well as academia. And by the way, we did invite uh, a few others to participate in the panel, such as uh, Lord Des Brown and Lord, Lord George Robertson, uh, who wanted to participate but unfortunately could not make it today. The format of this uh, discussion meeting um, will be that I will pose questions uh, individually to the distinguished panelists, one by one, and uh, in the expectation that they will um, answer uh, not excessively, but maybe three to four minutes. And uh, there'll be about seven of those questions in all, which uh, should leave ample time for then some interaction with, with all of you. Uh, with that uh, brief introduction then, let me uh, pose the first question, if I may, to Sir Jeremy Greenstock. It's sometimes argued that the UK's P5 status and global influence is linked to the possession of nuclear weapons and that therefore a like-for-like -like replacement of the current Trident system is essential. The question is to what extent is Britain's role in the world determined by its membership in the nuclear club and would the UK's international status be altered for better or for worse if there was any change to the proposed Trident like-for-like -like replacement? Well, Mark, the, the UK's image in the world and our influence in the world um, is composed of a whole range of things of which our nuclear weapons capability and our continuing possession of nuclear weapons um, is one of the least relevant in the modern age and one which is, I think, increasingly fading in people's perception. If you're talking about the generality of UN member states in the General Assembly or even in the Security Council. Our permanent membership of the Security Council derived much more from our victory in the Second World War and the range of our historical um, interests and, in, and, and influence through the imperial and colonial eras up to that point than from the actual possession of nuclear weapons, which wasn't clear in 1945 that we had. Uh, we still had to develop uh, through our association with the Manhattan Project and, and our own work at Altamaston and elsewhere, our capacity to explode a nuclear weapons device. So um, 
That is not an issue as far as the continuation of Trident is concerned, um, to my mind. The most important criterion for our influence in the world, like every other nation state, is economic in the 21st century. It's the economy, the economy, the economy. And that, of course, is relevant to this debate because nuclear weapons and Trident cost money. Um, and there are some trade-offs to be done. Uh, if we decide that we must have a nuclear weapon, then we must pay for it. But our influence comes from our association of relationships, our ability to manage those interests and relationships around the world, our capacity to solve problems for the international community in the various committees and councils and alliances and partnerships that we're part of, on our input into development and security behind development in the developing world, and a whole range of other things, um, at the back of which might from time to time come nuclear weapons capability. If, of course, you're talking about our relationship with the United States or our role in NATO, then it becomes much more important, but that's not how I took the question. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sir Jeremy. We will get to the uh, last two points that you mentioned, the role in NATO and the relationship with the United States. Uh, but before we get to that, let me uh, turn to uh, Sir Richard and uh, uh, pose a question. And, and in, pose, in answering the question, you're welcome to uh, 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 chime in on any of the previous uh, uh, answer or question. And the question I'd like to pose is, what is the basis for how the UK's credibility as a military power is perceived? Um, the nuclear deterrent and the conventional power projection capabilities both surely play a role. Is there any way to judge the relative importance of the nuclear and the conventional capabilities? Right. Um, first, can I just make a, a general point about um, the notion that what we're talking about here is a like-for-like -like replacement of Trident? Because I don't think that is what we're actually talking about. Um, to jump ahead to perhaps later bits in the, the discussion. What we're actually talking about is replacement for submarines with a much reduced capability to the capability we had uh, in the past, in the Cold War era and so on. So I, I, I don't like the like-for-like like bit, uh, and, and I think we should be cautious about that. We're talking about a much reduced nuclear capability in terms of its uh, scale and its deterrent effect, therefore. Now, m moving to your question... Um, the answer is, of course, both. So how, how do different, different countries, uh, both friends and enemies, potential enemies, perceive our military power? Uh, the answer is they would perceive it in relation to both of these things. I, rather, I very much agree with the point that Jeremy was making, that I think on a day-to-day -day basis for most countries, the way in which they perceive the contribution we make is increasingly in the world we've lived in for the last uh, 20 years or so, and the, the foreseeable world, our capacity to intervene as part of the international community in shaping a better world. Uh, for some countries, like the United States, like France, uh, like perhaps one or two of our NATO allies, the nuclear dimension uh, is um, more important. And as we'll go on uh, to discuss, I think, um, I hope, uh, what we decided to do about it would be very, very important for those, those countries. But for the generality of countries, I'd say that it's our conventional forces and our capacity to contribute to them on a day-to-day -day basis that has the most salience. Then if I come to your last, the last part of your question, which I think is very, very interesting, is there a way of weighing the relative contribution of conventional and nuclear forces? Now, in, in the conventional sphere, there are ways of doing this because you can generate scenarios, you compare different ways of delivering in relation to those scenarios the same effect. I, don't, I have never myself been able to establish an intellectually rigorous, I don't think there is one, way of comparing uh, conventional forces uh, and the contributions that they can make in various scenarios and nuclear forces because the nuclear forces are essentially dealing with a very, very low probability, high impact event uh, and the conventional forces are dealing with a much wider range. So there is no scientific operational analysis basis to make this comparison. So normally you do this on, on a combination of such a thing and of military judgment. And I suppose the last point I'd make is 
Uh, in relation to the military judgment that you exercise on that choice, in my experience, it depends which uniform you ask, the relative weight uh, they give uh, to the nuclear and the conventional. So um, ask a distinguished general in the room, and he's probably not that wild about it. Ask one or two of the distinguished admirals, uh, they would have a rather different view. And this also complicates it, I think. So there is no sort of underlying objective basis. There are different military judgments about the relative weight you should give to these things. Thank you very much. I, I quickly looked ahead in my questions and, and scribbled out like for like, and I'll think of some other word to use. Yeah. Um, and um, the, uh, the answer uh, feeds in very uh, uh, nicely to uh, the question after this one, the question I'll po pose to uh, Lord O'Donnell. But let me first of all uh, turn to uh, uh, Lord David Hane and ask, since all three of the political parties uh, suggest some retention of the deterrent, it can reasonably be assumed that the debate mm -hmm. will mainly be over continuous at sea deterrence, not over a decision uh, for Britain to cease to have a nuclear weapons capability. And the question I'd like to pose is, does this make sense unilater uh, unilaterally or in foreign policy terms? To what extent does continuous at sea deterrence, which was conceived in a Cold War context, uh, still and looking ahead prospectively, make sense, make strategic sense. Would immediate abandonment of continuous at sea deterrence enable the procurement timetable for replacement boats to be extended? Well, if you permit me, Mark, to start just by a brief comment on the question covered by Jeremy, because uh, I hope we can drive a stake through this um, argument that there's an equivalence between uh, a nuclear weapon status and permanent sta uh, membership of the United Nations. Just two points worth remembering. Uh, at the time that the Charter was agreed in 1945 and uh, the five permanent members were chosen and embedded in the Charter, uh, none of them were nuclear weapon states. One was about to become a nuclear weapon state, but that was not generally known. Uh, although it was undoubtedly known to the British, and we now know undoubtedly known to the Soviet Union for different reasons and by different routes and methods. Uh, but uh, they were none of them. And when you talk about this equivalence issue, are you seriously suggesting that North Korea, Pakistan, Israel will become a permanent member of the Security Council one day? Well, of course they won't. Uh, it's just completely fanciful. So where is the equivalence? And it also ignores the fact that the system by which permanent members are determined gives an absolute veto to the five permanent members because you have to amend the charter to change that list and that requires the ratification of all five permanent members, i.e. if we were to be displaced, we would have to be a willing party to it. Well, I don't expect that to happen in my lifetime. So, uh, just if we could, I think that, that now, the, the issues you've raised about continuous at sea deterrence, one can, I think, argue uh, that uh, this is a very British discussion that's going on because it's not probably the big issue that should be being looked at. But I think in realistic terms, it is the issue that will be being looked at between now and 2015 because the three main parties seem to be equally determined not to get into the territory of getting rid of the deterrent altogether. And if that is so, then the debate will be driven back to war, towards continuous at sea deterrence. I don't think that that discussion should be purely about British defence policy, though of course it has to be primarily about that. But there is an international dimension to that too. Uh, if you read the uh, article, which I'm sure you have done, that um, Schultz, Perry, Nunn, um, and um, Kissinger uh, revived their sequence of articles just about 10 days ago. They placed a very great deal of importance on the issue of de-alerting. Uh, and they launched some ideas about how the United States and Russia might mutually de-alert a substantial part of their, yes. of their weapons. Uh, well, uh, getting away from set continuous at sea deterrence, although not absolutely clearly a de-alerting measure, because to some extent we have de-alerted, but of course 
as long as you keep continuous at sea deterrence, there's not a great deal of credibility in saying you've de-alerted because nobody knows whether you really have or not. Uh, you just They've got your say-so. Whereas, of course, if you moved away from continuous at sea deterrence, that would be a considerable contribution to uh, de-alerting. And I think a very likely to be a positive one. The other thing I would think we, we ought to ask ourselves in the international context context is it's often suggested that if we did not have continuous at sea deterrence, then a decision by a British government to deploy a nuclear armed submarine at an early stage in a crisis would be very destabilizing. I think that argument needs to be tested rather, rather carefully. Uh, I'm not saying it is without value. I think it does have some value. But I think you can advance the alternative argument, which is to say that it might be an extremely important measure for handling a peculiarly dangerous crisis. So uh, I think there's a lot to be debated about there. And as I say, for reasons which I, I, I expect are not entirely respectable, I think that's where the debate will come to rest. Thank you very much. I, so well, well, well spoken. Uh, Lord uh, O'Donnell, you, uh, from your, your former insider's uh, uh, perspective, I wonder if you can offer some enlightenment uh, about how the Cabinet and the National Security Council might handle these issues and uh, on what evidence basis they should make such decisions. Right. First of all, let me um, back up what uh, Jeremy uh, and David and Bill Clinton said, it's, it's the economy, stupid. I mean, uh, I have sat on the board of the IMF, the World Bank. Uh, I've sat through more European councils, ECOFIN meetings than uh, I would care to count. And basically, it's your economic weight that's really important. And for all the points that were made there about how the, the Bretton Woods twins and all of the post-Second World War uh, architecture was put together, it wasn't based around, obviously, uh, the, the the holding or not of nuclear weapons. So I think that's a fairly clear, <coughs> one of the very, fairly clear things we can do. In terms of how decisions are made on this, uh, my background is as, as an economist and a public policy person, and it's a very frustrating area. I think it needs to be said. You kind of look for, in public policy reasons, a good evidence basis. You look for experiments. You look for creating data that might tell you about things. Uh, there's a very interesting book just been written by a guy called Charles Mansky about public policy under uncertainty. Um, you can't do any of that in this area. You, you, you look for answers to questions and you have lots of assertions. You have lots of people who have very strong views. Uh, trying to actually, we don't have, I, I call it, it's probably not appropriate here, the Gwyneth Paltrow uh, evidence. What we really like is sliding doors. You know, I'd like to have a world where we now made the announcement that we're not going to have nuclear weapons, and the world carries on. And we look at those two worlds and how they evolve. We are a million miles away from that kind of evidence. So we are going to be in the world of assertion quite a lot and people's judgments. What Richard was actually saying about judgments is very important here. And of course, when you try and weigh these different judgments, you're going to be looking at, well, where do they come from? Um, if uh, the admirals tell you one thing, then you kind of have a feeling that it's possibly not as independent as it might be. Now, the way public... They might be wise. They might be absolutely correct. I'm not arguing that uh, they're necessarily wrong. What I'm saying is uh, they're, they're just... You know, what we've tried to do in various other areas, and if you looked at the recent LSE Growth Commission, uh, what we've done with independent central banks, what we're trying to do in planning various climate change things, the establishment of independent bodies to take, it, to take issues which are very long term, very complex, uh, that don't get settled within a, a, an individual parliament, to take them out of the political day-to-day -day arena. Now, I wonder if there's something along those lines that might be relevant. In terms of getting back to your question, how would it be uh, resolved? Well, these sorts of issues tend to be <laughs> First and foremost, it, we need to be practical. We live currently in a world of coalition. The start for all of this process is almost always a bilateral between the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, and they have a little chat. And then we get into other processes which will involve, uh, in the new uh, post-coalition world, the world of the National Security Council, the National Security Council trying to look at this, and they will try and come up with evidence. The answer to most of the questions will be, we don't know. Right? I've looked at all of the questions in this area, and the, the truth is there will be judgments, but 
any degree of certainty in answers to these questions, I would be quite nervous about. Uh, so we don't know for certain. That means that it will be uh, a judgmental issue and they'll have to weigh up different people's judgments using their political judgment about what they think are the right answers. Um, what, one point to add here, it was mentioned about the economic uh, implications of, let's say, Trident versus something else or, or uh, a nuclear deterrent versus no nuclear deterrent. In the end, my guess is the economic implications for the UK economy would be quite small. It's a guess. Uh, you need to do a lot of work on that. But my guess is the defence budget would be much the same with or without a nuclear deterrent. That's my guess. I uh, stress, you know, it's just a judgment call. Uh, and that, that, you know, the kinds of numbers we're talking about here would be second or third order for UK economy. So I would suspect that the answer to that is it's quite small. But if you ask me for the strong evidence based on that, I'd have to say uh, we haven't got much. I think the other point that, that Cabinet that's really important here is that what's the nature of the question? I think, as, as Richard was saying, um, the nature of the question is we currently have uh, Trident, we currently have CASD policy, sorry, uh, continuous at sea deterrence policy. Um, so it takes a brave politician to move away from the status quo, has enormous weight in these sorts of debates. Um, that doesn't mean to say that you know, in an ideal world we might want to get all of the options and weigh them all up. In reality, the the politics of it is that the status quo has enormous amount of weight. Whether it should or not is a good question, but I suspect that trying to make the case to move away from it uh, would require a lot of evidence. Given what I've said about, I think the evidence is all, always going to be a bit fuzzy, uh, I think it's, you know, there's a bias in the system towards the status quo. Whether that's a good thing or not is, is probably for others. debate among sharply conflicting uh, points of view, uh, you will have been disappointed, but I, I hope you will not be disappointed by the manner in which we are advancing the level of, uh, of discourse. Uh, but uh, uh, Sir, Sir Richard, and then I will ask you another question after you oh, join you? in Oh, here. right. Oh, well, I'm being very greedy then. But the, no, please. I, I just want to make an observation which follows on from what <coughs> Gus was saying, because the, the, there's a distinction, I think, to be drawn between <coughs> excuse me, the fundamental uncertainty about thinking about what will the world be like in the period when the, the successor system, or the successor submarines to the present submarines, might be deployed, uh, which is the world of 2030 to 2050 or 2060, what would such a world be like? And there is no way of knowing what it would be like in any scientific or economist's way. You know there's all sorts of techniques which uh, I guess is much better on than I am, uh, etc. And so you have to make a series of assumptions about what such a world would look like. Now, what I think is then quite important is not to jump to the conclusion that that therefore means that the choice you make between alternative systems is also itself uh, something that you can't, uh, you can't work away at in, in using techniques of a kind that are uh, very familiar uh, to people who've worked in government and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So by that I mean, and I, I, I'm, I'm saying this because I, I fear people could have misunderstood what I said at the beginning. At the beginning, what I was saying was it's very, very difficult to use operational lines, for instance, to compare an investment in conventional capability with an investment in your deterrent. Once you have decided, if you were to decide you need a successor system, and you work your way through the uncertainty, and you define the scale of the system, the deterrent effect you wish to pose, then absolutely you can use a whole series of techniques to devise the most cost-effective solution. And that is what was done when I was involved in the late 70s and the early 80s. That was what was done when mm -hmm. Gus was in charge mm -hmm. in 2006 or whenever it mm -hmm. was. So the choice of system is not whimsical and is not, and is underpinned by a whole set of analysis of a kind which is quite similar to other public policy. The problem is to devise the setting and the conclusion you reach about the weight of deterrent effect that you need to pose. Now, the problem in the debate is people jump from uh, the first set of uncertainties to saying, well, therefore, we could have this, and okay, it would do this sort of job, it's sort of unspecified, but it's the same as that. That's a very dangerous road to go down. So there's Thank you. uncertainties and there are things you can analyze. Before I get to the question that I wanted to pose, uh, uh, David wanted yeah, to join I just wanted in. to take one point that Gus made. I, I entirely agree with his judgment 
that the size of the defence budget in the period ahead of us uh, is probably not going to be greatly affected uh, by the decisions on nuclear, if only because if they do move away from the status quo, and don't let's forget it's not just the coalition government we're talking about because the main decision on the deterrent and its replacement is going to be taken by the government elected in 2015. But uh, if they did move away from any part of the status quo by, for example, dropping uh, continuous at sea deterrence, then I think there will be strong pressure to, uh, to divert some of the funds not spent, which might not be very big anyway, uh, towards conventional. But the point I want to make is that although these figures are not colossal, the balance between uh, nuclear and conventional is extremely important because if we are squeezing conventional now very, very hard, some people would say too hard, mm -hmm. then part of that squeeze is coming from the nuclear spend. And I was very struck in the debate that we had in the House of Lords back in January when Tom King, a former Defence Secretary, not someone who normally uh, advocates moving away from the status quo on nuclear, said, apropos of Britain's influence, it'll be far more based on what we are able to do in the way of conflict prevention, conflict resolution, conventional force deployment that will determine what the rest of the world think of Britain than it will be on our retention of the nuclear deterrent in whatever form that may be. Um, please, Sir Jeremy. Just for the audience's sake, to try and put a figure on the cost that we're talking about, Gus says second or third order, um, I, wearing another hat, am a member of the basic uh, Trident Renewal Commission, and I do not speak in that guise today, but in the, looking at the figures from 2012 to 2062 on what it would mean for a like-for-like -like replacement, it probably averages out somewhere in the region of £2 billion a year, although the weight of that might come in the 20s when we're rebuilding submarines or building new submarines. But it's that sort of order. It's not tens of billions a year. Yeah, and, and if we're talking about two billion spent on that versus two billion spent on conventional forces, that's... It would have to come out of the MOD budget. Exactly. It would, so, so macroeconomically, yeah. zip. It's, it's, yes, I mean, there are <coughs> other questions about the economy, but yeah. it's that size, not that. In terms that of the national economy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, this is, a very, this is a very helpful discussion. Let me, um, uh, segueing from uh, particularly the points that uh, Lord Hene made about the uh, conventional and... Uh, in nuclear uh, capabilities and um, effect on and defense uh, capabilities. Ask uh, uh, Sir Richard, does the United Kingdom's possession of nuclear weapons actually make a difference in military or diplomatic interactions and relationships across a range of other issues? Is the nuclear deterrence capability an asset or a liability for the United Kingdom in its relationship with foreign governments? And given the current fiscal climate, if the choice is between uh, the resources for a Trident successor and conventional forces, particularly expeditionary forces, what would be more important uh, to, the, uh, to the Pentagon officials that you used to deal with so much and to other NATO allies? Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> um, just, to, um, just to make a, a point which is, I suppose, um, which is relevant to this and relevant to the point that, um, <coughs> excuse me, that Jeremy was making. The Ministry of Defence um, recently published its forward equipment plan for the next 10 years, which um, uh, adds up to £160 billion. Um, uh, the, the, these figures are from memory, so we may find they're not strictly precise, but this is roughly it. Of that £160 billion, uh, which in any case um, is very likely to be an optimistic assessment of what can be afforded, given uh, the state of the country and the arguments over the spending review and so on. Uh, something like, this is capital, this is the Ministry of Defence's capital programme plus support for that capital programme. Something like 38 billion is earmarked for both the end of the astute class of submarines uh, and their coming into service and the replacements for Vanguard. So what you can see is that, um, not at all cutting across Gus's point about 
the macroeconomic, the national economy implications of all this, the defence choices mm -hmm. are indeed, I think, very, very acute because government decided, quite rightly in my view, uh, that it was for the Ministry of Defence to weigh the relative priority of these different things, and they have to do it now within this envelope, which, as I say, in my opinion, is, is going to be smaller rather than larger when we get to it. So this is a very, very acute problem in terms of Ministry of Defence planning, and, and we shouldn't underestimate its acuteness by sort of wrapping it up in some broader figures, which is sometimes uh, done. Not, I'm not talking about anyone on this panel today. Now, if you then say, well... What does that mean for the attitudes of allies uh, to this and what will the Pentagon feel? Unsurprisingly, I think the Pentagon, qua the Pentagon, uh, will be very, very reluctant to get into such issues. Uh, so for them, the answer will be, can't you just keep up your spending and do both? For most countries, I think they would give weight, uh, as uh, mm -hmm. David and Jeremy have been saying, actually to the importance of the conventional contribution we can make. But even amongst our allies, you could say this is slightly hypocritical because they're all reducing their budgets and shedding capability, so I'm not sure their voice is that strong. What I think would be a key consideration in government is the, the relationship between us and our key allies, that is the Americans uh, and, in this context, the French. And if you think about it in those terms, then this is, I think, a very, very sensitive subject for them. And it's sensitive not just in relation to what will we do, uh, but also it's sensitive actually in relation to continuous at sea deterrence. Because regardless of the merits of that or demerits of it, and we can talk about it later, um, for both the United States and France, continuous at sea deterrence is part of how they deploy their deterrence. And therefore, they're going to be very interested in any gestures we make. And so what our nuclear weapons do is, I think, they buy us a certain sort of influence in key parts of NATO and in our bilateral relationships with the United States and France. Uh, and conversely, uh, as Gus was explaining, they therefore bind us in to extreme caution about any step that would uh, wrong foot them or potentially wrong foot them. And, um, uh, amongst the myths, I think, about this are the idea that if we were to give up our deterrent, the French government or the French military and strategic elite would be quite pleased. In my experience, the last thing they want us to do is uh, to go down uh, that route for the obvious reason that if we can do it, our rationale has got to be that we can wrap ourselves up in some broader deterrent protection, uh, and what applies to us applies to them. So I think that it is, it is very much an issue about our relationship with the United States and our relationship uh, with France. It buys us positive things in relation to both those things. Does it in itself justify what we spend? Um, it buys us influence in NATO and things like the high-level group and nuclear planning and so on. Is that the rationale for why we'd spend all this money? Obviously not. Um, but those are the key relationships. Well, thanks very much. I let me turn to the diplomats uh, and ask a similar question. If the United Kingdom were to, quote unquote, step down the ladder mm -hmm. toward nuclear disarmament, what would be the implications for the United Kingdom's relationship with the United States and other NATO uh, partners? What would be the implications for relations with the non-aligned movement states and the Commonwealth states? Would the United Kingdom's influence maybe even increase with some of these uh, groups of countries? And to what extent would the United Kingdom's national interests be served by making positive steps toward nuclear disarmament, noting that the United Kingdom is already perceived as the uh, most progressive and forward-looking nuclear weapon state uh, in regards to disarmament? Maybe I could ask you both to, uh, to address that question. Um, Jeremy? This is an, an extremely important part uh, of the arguments that, that we're getting into. Not just because the Non-Proliferation Treaty exists and needs to be implemented and would um, be a tragic loss if it faded into irrelevance, because it's an absolutely vital part of controlling proliferation 
to states that don't yet have nuclear weapons capability, um, but also because of a fundamental issue we haven't yet got into in this conversation, <coughs> which is that it might be, uh, there is a, an arguable case to be made, that in the circumstances of the later 21st century, it could be more dangerous for us to have nuclear weapons than not to have them in, in certain threat situations. Or it could be argued proliferation is a greater danger than nuclear blackmail or the threat of nuclear attack on our territory or on our interests. That having more nuclear materials around the world in the wrong hands could be a more dangerous future than having a great state threatening us with their large nuclear capability, which we have to deter. And in the former instance, the deterrent does not work because they're in their hands of responsible people. Deterrent, uh, the deterrent works between, as it were, responsible holders of nuclear weapons, and the P5 have shown how that can be done. If proliferation takes nuclear weapons, um, it's already gone to another four states, possibly and soon a, a fifth. Um, it moves us into a different era, and proliferation is more likely. So there is a balance of judgment to be made on this issue as to whether if we were, if we continued to be a leader in the slow implementation of Article 6 of the MPT, that we must get down to zero at some point in the future and gain credibility from that, we might be starting a process where proliferation was less difficult to handle, which would be very important to us, we would get a good deal of credibility and credit from a large number of members of the General Assembly. Uh, and we might be reducing a threat that could be as dangerous as the threat of nuclear blackmail or nuclear attack. Um, but we need to be careful, and I'm sure the, the panel will get into this, that the UK on its own is not the major factor in this. We could go way out on a limb and have little effect on the global truth of this and do little to our own image except show that we didn't have the economy to sustain uh, what had once been important to us and be left out there having made a gesture which didn't achieve any greater security. And that argument will be used in this debate. So we come back to the judgmental issues, and I hope at some point in this conversation we will also get into the factor that's beginning to come in on the horizon of virtual nuclear deterrence, of a technological understanding between nuclear weapons holding states that they can reduce to a very small level, uh, but watch each other very carefully and know each other's capability to recompose a nuclear capability very quickly and leave it at a very low level. There are all sorts of ways of playing this, but there's great uncertainty as to the relative weight of what we would be doing to our national security interests by any of these paths. Thank yeah. you very much. I think, I think you have to distinguish rather clearly between stepping down the ladder and stepping off the ladder. Hmm. Uh, they are two completely different things which are likely to have completely different uh, effects on our allies and partners, on our adversaries and so on. Uh, I happen to think that stepping off the ladder would buy us very little credit and would have very heavy costs uh, with our uh, chief allies, as Richard has suggested. Uh, and I honestly think you can put this to the test by simply asking yourself, if you were writing uh, a paper for Kim Jong-un, where would you put uh, the value of Britain ceasing to have uh, the nuclear deterrent it has? Well, I imagine you put it below your considerations of the US, of the Chinese deterrents, of the possibility of South Korea and uh, Japan developing nuclear weapons, 
and about 15 other things, and I wonder whether it would figure on the list at all. Uh, the same may not be quite so true of Iran, but that's largely because the Iranians have an unbelievable capacity mm. to exaggerate our importance <laughs> in the world uh, and, um, and tend to get it totally wrong. So they might actually give it slightly greater mm. value than a decent a strategical thinker would do. So uh, I think stepping off uh, would, be, uh, would be far more negative than positive. Stepping down, which is, after all, what successive British governments have been doing since the end of the Cold War, quite <coughs> carefully and quite, uh, I think, uh, in a well-balanced way, as has, I think, considerably increased our importance in the eyes of both nuclear weapon states, the other ones, and the non-nuclear weapon states. We have been seen to be people who've been prepared to really take our Article 6 obligations reasonably seriously. And so I think that if we were to take another step down the ladder in the context of the debate on Trident replacement, we should get a good deal of benefit from it, both in multilateral dealings and in bilateral dealings around the world. Uh, and I wouldn't want to venture too far into the US and French considerations because I'm not all that knowledgeable about either of them. Well, thank you very much. I kept waiting for... Um a metaphor about stepping off the ladder and breaking a leg. But, uh, <coughs> you kept it to uh, a very serious level, as appropriate. Let me pose one last question uh, uh, as the chair, and e any of you uh, who wish to comment, or all of you, and then uh, we'll go to um, other questions and comments from the audience. Here's the question, the last question. Supposing the Trident alternative study concludes that there are credible and feasible alternatives uh, to the Trident replacement, if the United Kingdom should decide to move away for what my notes say is a like-for-like -like replacement, but we'll change it to something else, for the Trident successor, but still retain uh, an independent nuclear deterrent, <coughs> would that have any impact on the United Kingdom's status within the, within the P5 uh, or its global leadership role more broadly? If the Trident alternative study concludes that there are alternative and credible systems uh, or postures um, to uh, the current kind of uh, a system, what would the international perspective of the United Kingdom government be uh, if the United Kingdom, despite there being an alternative and feasible alternative, <coughs> decided to continue on the current path it is and have uh, something that looks like Trident? So both sides mm -hmm. of the question. Mm -hmm. You want to go first? Uh, um, well, I, I could have a go. Um, I don't myself believe there is such an alternative. If, um, hypothetically, there were such an alternative uh, and you could develop a credible strategic rationale for why you were adopting it, then um, it, would, uh, it would have no impact on your, um, uh, on your international reputation, I think. So I think, you, I think it would be a perfectly manageable situation. So if you could, if you could tell a credible story <coughs> about why I've decided to do this, um, mm. uh, and, it was, mm. and it was indeed believable, mm. then uh, the impact would be um, nil. My concern would be mm. that if, you, if there were no such alternative uh, and a government dressed it up mm. as being credible and indeed sort of played around with both the rationale and the underpinning logic for why mm. they'd chosen it, unfortunately the elites in our key allies mm. would rapidly understand that that's what they'd done mm. uh, and that would um, fundamentally damage yeah. our reputation with uh, our yeah. key allies. It, it might uh, have different impacts on different, uh, on other countries for the sorts of reasons that Jeremy and, uh, and David explained earlier. Very good. Gus? Just... I think the issue would be, the policy issue that you would put to a Prime Minister of the National Security Council would be option A, which is um, Trident, option B, which is something which you think has a broadly equivalent uh, deterrent effect, plus whatever it is else. Because if they're both the same, why would you change? Right? So the, the implication of, of part B must be that it's cheaper. Right? And then the question is, so, so to get the option analysis correct, it will yeah. be Trident versus this other option, hypothetical option, plus 
what are you going to do with the money you've saved? It could be that that's uh, for conventional forces or whatever. And, and then you'd have to assess to yourself how important are conventional forces in terms of all of these impacts. And the interesting thing for me, just as an aside, is having lived through you know, uh, Iraq War I, sitting around the, the war cabinet table, all the way through to, most recently, the Libya one, actually the experience you have, and you have to kind of watch out for this psychological bias in your own system, is you're always dealing with conventional uh, warfare. Therefore, prime ministers, secretaries of state are all the time thinking, I wish I had a bit more I-star. I wish I had uh, a few more chips, if we go back to Falklands. You know, the, the, so, and if you said, well, we can give you more toys with this, mm -hmm. actually, that's great. And um, so, so they would think, well, this is actually rather good news for me, because if, um, mm. you know, it, let's say a Syria meant that you wanted to do something, the kinds of things you're going to want to do are clearly not use a giant submarine. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, that's not where we are. Um, now, and the other side of that, the loss of, if you like, this 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 like for like replacement turns it's out not, not to be like for like, and is actually a smaller degree of deterrence, however you might measure that. Uh, where, where's the cost for that? Actually, you, you won't observe that in the next conflict. You know, it'll be a, a kind of unobservable, and therefore rather difficult to get to, to grips with as to how you would weigh that against the others. So. I think it's quite an interesting. Uh, it's quite an interesting question as to why you haven't had prime ministers and secretary of state for defence saying, actually, I'm, you know, quite got a bias towards the things I use a lot. Yeah, that's reasonable. Any other, or shall we uh, turn? I, I, I think there's one more element to, yes. to put into this particular question, Mark, mm -hmm. um, and, and it refers particularly to our relationship with the Americans. Um, Obviously, they would like us to continue in, in both spheres, conventional and, and nuclear. Uh, and we're going to have to make some choices. The choices we're making at the moment are affecting our conventional ability far more than our nuclear. That's the stage we've reached, and those are the adjustable sums. The army is coming down in boots on the ground. The number of ships, the number of aircraft we can deploy are coming down the whole time. And the Americans are watching this because they have huge respect for our quality in all these fields and intelligence and diplomacy, government to government relations, etc. But they're beginning to despise our quantity. Quantity reaches a point where it's irreducible if we're to retain respect in the conventional sphere. And we're very close to, or may even have crossed, that minimum bar. And I think we're going to need to rethink this as a nation, because to start spending close to 2%, or, God forbid, even less than 2% on the whole range of defence forces, and the defence budget, is getting into dangerous territory for a difficult century. And the Americans will be as pleased, I think, if we continue if we restore a conventional capability but reduce to a pretty bare minimum, which they will adjust to, on the nuclear <coughs> deterrent front, um, but they will begin <coughs> to despise us if the budget takes us so low in both that we're not really offering anything any longer as first ally and as the country that probably internationally has the best balance between hard and soft power approaches of any I can think of. Could I, yes, just add one point. We haven't discussed at all yet the extent to which a four <coughs> trident submarine uh, continuous at sea uh, is still as relevant as it was when it was quite clearly devised to deal with the Soviet Union. It wasn't devised to deal with China. Uh, I don't imagine anyone in uh, Whitehall has ever wasted a lot of time thinking about how to deter a Chinese nuclear attack on Britain, certainly not yeah. since the deal over Hong Kong <laughs> was made. So it was all about the Soviet Union. Now, is it still relevant? And if it is still relevant, how relevant is it? And is it relevant, that posture, to 
what I take to be, because that's been in successive white papers, the rationale, that this is an ultimate insurance policy. Okay, it's an insurance policy against who? Well, it's against obviously an insurance policy against other people with nuclear weapons. Uh, because we have given uh, negative security assurances to all the non-nuclear states that we will not use nuclear weapons against them. So uh, you you'll then have to go down the list and say, well, how relevant is it to North Korea, to Iran, to Israel, to India, to Pakistan, and to possible countries who might break out if the Iranian and North Korean examples lead to regional breakouts in the Middle East or in Northeast Asia. And I don't think that question is ever getting asked. Uh, I think there is a real sense in which we are just carrying on down the track. This is what we decided 40 years ago, and it must be still perfectly OK. Well, thank you, David. Let's, uh, we, we've timed this very well. About half of the time is left for some audience interaction. We'll do the usual manner. Uh, I will call on you. You'll say your name, even though I know you very well. And uh, you'll wait for the microphone to come. So uh, Ted, and then Jeremy, and then third will be the gentleman here. And we'll continue. Thank you very much. Ted C. with BASIC. Uh, and I wanted to touch on a specific subset of foreign policy implications of Trident replacement, which I don't know that the panel has really dealt with uh, this afternoon. And that is that, as far as NATO is concerned, in some sense, Trident is a callable asset in times of crisis. Now, this is particularly relevant since the other nuclear assets which NATO believes it possesses, the U.S. theater nuclear weapons, which are based in five allied countries, are in a bit of trouble at the moment in terms of forward planning, since both the weapons themselves and their delivery systems are right in the middle of a very large and very expensive uh, replacement slash improvement cycle, and it's raising a number of questions about the longevity and stability of that deterrent force. So what I'm suggesting is that you may find in the UK that there is more weight given to Trident replacement by NATO allies in the near future, it's precisely because of the questions that are being raised about the theater nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. I think what we'll do is we'll take three questions at a time, then we'll go back to the panelists, whoever would like to address. Wait, just give, give, give it back to Jeremy Stocker right in the back of you. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Stocker, member of the Institute. Um, I'd like to uh, briefly address a point that uh, Lord Hannay made in his first set of remarks, namely the connection between CASD and crisis stability, which of course is a absolutely key foreign policy implication. And I think Lord Hannay was right to observe that there could be circumstances under which the signal sent by sailing a submarine could be useful in managing that crisis. But I think equally there would be other circumstances where it would be very unhelpful. And surely that is a signal that a British government would send or should send because it had taken a positive decision that that was a useful thing to do. What we should not be is in the position of having to send that signal in a crisis because we have no alternative, because without sailing a submarine, we have no deterrent capability available. And it seems to me that that is the killer argument in favor of CASD, that it removes a whole set of potentially escalatory signals and decisions that politicians have to make when actually they're focused on trying to manage a ma major crisis. Um, and therefore, you're greatly easing the crisis stability and crisis management problem by removing that set of lead-in decisions that have to be made so that the politicians ultimately only have to make one decision, which is to press the button. And if they want to send an escalatory signal of sailing a submarine, well, you can do that within the appropriate period of notice. You sail the second submarine, the one that is normally off watch. And, and I think you're right to identify that the argument uh, in CASD is about crisis stability, but I think perhaps we draw slightly different conclusions. Thank you. Just pass the microphone a row ahead of you, and then we'll take the third, and then we'll come back to the panel. And I, sh I should have mentioned rules of engagement. You're allowed to use uh, acronyms like CASD. We all now know what that means. Mm. Yeah, I'm also <laughs> a the Institute and of Civitas International. My question to the panel is about the world of 2050 in China. Um, does the panel think that the deterrent should be then in the national interest or in parts of the broader West? Would we even have a West? Um, the world of 2050 will see great challenges to do with uh, 
climate heating, ocean acidification, population migration flows, resource depletion across the planet, mm. including energy resources, and obviously competition now for rare earth elements. Um, the World 2050 will also see a new type of um, non-radiation producing uh, nuclear weapon based on helium-3, which China currently is in the um, running to secure, and America is already using to detect things. But um, the elephant in the room really is the, um, the rise of an opposing value system. We in the West, we create international architecture. It still exists now. It needs reform. But we really have a rise of an empire here um, with a different view value system. So do we think we actually might be thinking of the unthinkable, perhaps a stronger replacement for the deterrent? OK, we've got three interesting questions, all kind of in a similar uh, direction. Uh, more weight uh, to Trident because of tactical nuclear weapon uh, withdrawal, possibly. Um, unhelpful signaling um, by, uh, by removing uh, a continuous at sea deterrence. And looking ahead to 2015 and the rise of the Chinese empire with opposing value systems all seem to uh, suggest that there are some implications here uh, that are negative for giving up uh, the current kind of system. Can I, can I, can I Please. say yes. something on, on that last point about technology? Uh, I mean, you raised the, the possibility of a, a whole new <coughs> class of nuclear weapons. Um, but of course, I think the interesting thing when you're making these public policy decisions is they are desperately public policy under enormous uncertainty. Technological uncertainties are huge. And of course, on the other hand, you have to have this debate about, so what are the uh, assumptions you're going to make about is CASD, uh, going back to it, uh, viable in 20 to 30 years? You know, will there be a technology that says, oh, there's our submarine, and it's like, huh. you can do it incredibly easily. Um, can't do it at the minute, but, you know, who knows which way the technology is going to go. So there's an enormous amount of uncertainty associated with uh, playing out any of these things. I think the one thing we're, we're fairly clear about is that the economic power is going um, east quite dramatically, and the, uh, one of the things we really need to factor into all of these things is that the, the West's uh, economic might relative to the east is, is going to be much, much uh, smaller. And that's, I think, the mindset which I have when I think about this set of issues. I'll, I'll let others talk about it. Um, Go ahead. Well, if I can deal with um, the, uh, the questions briefly. The, f the first question about NATO um, assets, I think, is a very good point. Um, I think, ideally, um, there are good arguments for maintaining um, the present structure because it's good for burden sharing. And I think that's the position that has been the position of the United States up until now. Whether it's sustainable, I don't know. So you could, um, uh, you could be right. And we shouldn't, as we do sometimes, we shouldn't overlook mm -hmm. the fact that our forces, subject to all the small print that is familiar to this audience, mm -hmm. Uh, and nuclear forces are indeed declared to NATO, and in certain circumstances, quite clearly, would be used in that context. Um, so I think it's a very good point. Uh, on the point about continuous at-sea deterrence, there is, I think, a difference between can I, in a period of emerging tension, be confident that I can have one boat at sea, and indeed, the point that was being made, be capable of putting another boat at sea, and therefore sending signals if I want to, or <clears throat> not sending signals if I, I don't want to. Uh, can I be confident of doing that in a period of tension? And does that imply that forever and a day, in all circumstances, I should be deploying my deterrent? Now, I think those are two different points. Uh, so in other words, um, is the argument for continuous at-sea deterrence in mm -hmm. present strategic mm -hmm. circumstances an obviously compelling one. Uh, I suspect, you know, there might be views on the panel that say, not obviously. What does that imply about for the future? Well, that requires you to say, what might the world be like in 2030? And what sort of capability do I need in relation to that world in 2030? And that might be a rather more difficult question, because, but it might be a question that led you to say, I need to be able to sustain this capability for periods of months or years or whatever. That might employ a different number of boats. But I think the CASD argument uh, gets uh, shortened into a series of assertions, each of which needs to be unpicked and examined on its mm. own merits. Instead, it's wrapped up as, for X, Y, and Z reasons, it's obvious that we should always have a submarine at sea. Uh, now, 
the other dimension of Casdi is, imagine you relaxed it, but you were very <laughs> uncertain about what the world was going to be like in 2030 to 2050. What difference would it make? That seems to me to be a question which absolutely the government should be addressing mm -hmm. uh, in the period ahead. I don't know what the answer is to that question, but uh, I, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't jump from the, points, the interesting points that the speaker was making to the assumption that therefore, under all circumstances, CASD is required because essentially that is an argument that says under all strategic circumstances, we have to hedge a bolt from the blue attack from somewhere. And that is quite an interesting argument because the rest of our forces obviously are not uh, on that basis. Um, all I'd say about the 2050 point is um, two things is I'll have a little bet with Gus. I'm not sure I'll be around in 2050, but I think I could be reasonably confident that in 2050, uh, actually submarines will not, you know, the sea will not be uh, transparent. So I, I, I bet in big money, you know, a couple of quid or something. Um, when, when you think about, uh, for me that's big money, obviously not for him. Uh, when you think about, um, when you think about um, uh, China and the UK deterrent in relation to China, you get into a subject we've half touched on but not really touched on perhaps enough, which is uh, obviously somebody needs to have the capability to deter China. There is this country called the United States. And the question is, what do we add? Now, we have an argument, a rationale for our deterrent that essentially is variations around quite an old argument about the second center for decision making, um, dressed up. Um, but ultimately, we're not offering full deterrent reassurance to the whole world. Uh, and we're never going to do that. So it's a question of what's our contribution in relation to China that the United States can't make, I think, is the issue. Yeah, I mean, picking up on Richard's point there, uh, I entirely agree. I really do find it, but perhaps that's due to lack of imagination, I really do find it fairly difficult to foresee circumstances in which a Britain, which in relative power terms is going to be less powerful in 2050 than it is now, uh, is going to be a key player in any equation surrounding China and its neighbors, which of course must include India. And so uh, I, I really can't believe that we should allow our strategic decisions now to be much influenced by the Chinese dimension, which for the same reasons as Richard, I think, is going to be in the hands of others than us. Uh, on this question of um, uh, continuous at sea deterrence, uh, the deployment, uh, if you didn't have it. Uh, I don't, I hope I didn't suggest that I thought there was a straightforward yes or no answer to it. I don't think there is. I think there are arguments on both sides. You can argue uh, that uh, to have to deploy in the middle of a crisis would be, could be very destabilizing. Personally, I think you can also argue a number of arguments for saying no, it could become a perfectly manageable tool of crisis management uh, and it would require a lot of very careful doctrine and so on if you move to that situation. But all I was saying was that I thought the subject should be given a proper airing, not used as a kind of knockdown argument uh, one way or the other. Very good. I'm in the manageable tool part of the, the argument. I've heard nothing that convinces me that there's so strong a difference between CASD and non-CASD that it isn't an option. I think it is an option. Um, on, on 2050, uh, if we're all alive and then watching this flickering film of, of this session um, and looking at the world around us in 2050, uh, we will be amazed at the things we missed and didn't talk about. It's going to be a completely different world. And for the first part of it, a very much more polarised world where things happening locally in the region, in a, in a nation state, are going to be more interesting and more difficult than things that are happening at the, at the global level. And the point about Trident is that Having nuclear weapons capability in those circumstances will answer a tiny fraction of the threat problems that we're facing. A very, very tiny fraction. There are lots of other capabilities that we need. 
As for the NATO question, I think we need to be, from time to time, pretty nationalistic about the decisions we make about our own set, and, set of weapons capability. Others in NATO may want us to continue, but I don't think it's necessarily vital that we listen to them as against the main considerations for our most immediate defence criteria. Um, the fact that we have a nuclear capability or not will be crucial. What type it is, I think they have to leave to us. Thank you very much. Could I just uh, chime in myself? Um, the, the unknowables of the 2050 time frame, I think, extend to uh, the question of uh, China and whether uh, it will be a, a country with uh, opposing values. I think yeah. maybe the question was posed as a kind of, for example, but I don't think we have to be at all presumptuous that, uh, that China would pose any uh, threat to any uh, uh, of the Western countries. I've got now a number of people. I'd like to uh, uh, give the floor to the first three on my list will be uh, Lord uh, David uh, Rothsbottom, uh, uh, Lord Roper, and then in the back, uh, Brigadier uh, uh, Ben Barry. So here in the front and then over here. David Ramswell, I'm a member of the Institute. Now, I was always brought up to believe that there are two definitions of affordability. One is, can you afford it? And the other is, can you afford to give up what you've got to give up in order to afford it? You, Jeremy, you talked about the balance between conventional and the nuclear and where we stood in the world. I must admit, I'm one of the people who do not believe that the nuclear deterrent should be in the defense budget mm. because I believe actually it is not a fair question to ask of our military planners and its use is political. But my question is this, that if we start looking at national self-interest, we're looking at national defense as well. And I'm interested that none of the panel have yet mentioned cyber and all the continuing threat of cyber, which is not just military threatening the use of the Trident, but it's also economic, as we know, very, very much. And therefore, the question going back to affordability, can we afford to leave cyber out of this equation when we're looking at this particular replacement problem? Thank you. And uh, now, uh, Lord Roper here on the, on the right, uh, Jenny. Thank you very much. John Roper, member of the Institute. Um, can I begin by asking Richard Mottram if he could explain what he means by saying it's not like for like? Is he saying that the number of warheads deployed will be significantly smaller than were originally deployed in the Trident boats, or is there some other argument? And secondly, if the cruise missile option were to be considered, would there be arms control objections from the Americans who've always wanted there to be a rather clear distinction between nuclear coming through ballistic missiles and cruise missiles only being used for conventional purposes? Thank you. And now in the, in the last row in the back, Ben. Um, ben Barry, I'm an Institute staff, and to use Sir Richard's criteria, I'm a former undistinguished brigadier. I'd like to make two points. Um, There's no the such thing as an undistinguished brigadier. Um, the possible f there are a wide range of possible global futures, but we've seen a strategic trend of WMD, not just nuclear, proliferation. And in some cases, we've not just seen a strategic capability, but we've seen at least one country uh, taking the strategic capability and turning it down into an operational and tactical level capability. I think, you can also, I think it's also a mistake to separate rational and irrational regimes. Behavior can change, and even within a regime, you can have bits that can behave rationally and irrationally at different times. You could have a government that was irrational, but a rational military that controlled the nuclear weapons, or vice versa. But I'd also observe that even in the most apparently r irrational states, the regime elites appear to have an understandable interest in their own survival. Hmm. But I think there's an elephant in the room here uh, which is that there would be foreign policy implications of a significant failure of deterrence. 30 years ago, conventional deterrence failed in the Falklands. And if the operation to restore the status quo ante hadn't succeeded, the British government would have fallen and there would have probably been a massive dent to British political and military influence and self-confidence that would have lasted a generation. Um, and if 
British nuclear deterrence failed to deter WMD use, either Great Britain, its interests, its forces, or an ally, I think there could be near-catastrophic foreign policy, domestic, <coughs> and indeed reputational impact. And I think that's the other side of the equation, which so far uh, we haven't discussed. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have questions about cyber, about defining uh, not like-for-like like, uh, cruise missile uh, with dual-use uh, capabilities and the uh, foreign policy implications of failure of deterrence. Uh, since you had a very specific question posed to you, maybe explain yourself. What do you explain mean? Explain myself. Not like for life. Uh, what I mean by this is um, because, we're, because we have Trident D5, and Trident D5, unless we move to an alternative system, is going to continue, I think, till 2040 or whatever. And because we have four submarines currently, and the proposition is we only have four submarines in future, or perhaps you'll have three, and that's a, a discussion we've had in the past as well. People say this is a like-for-like -like deterrent, and it was all devised in the Cold War, and so what we have is a Cold War product. But the, I was the person, along with others much more distinguished than me that I worked with at the time, who helped fashion the Cold War decision to opt for Trident. And I think that, uh, but there are people in the room who can correct this, the explosive power of our current deterrent is roughly one quarter of what it was we devised in a Cold War context. I think it's the case that the submarines that will be deployed, if that's the decision the government takes, will have half the number of operational tubes that the Vanguard class submarines have. Now, if I buy something that has half of something, I don't call that like for like. I call it really something very, very different. But it's not simply, it's not simply the, ca the capability of the submarines. It's the whole way in which, and I think it was either David or Jeremy who made this point, the whole way in which we have consistently reduced and reduced and reduced the nuclear element of our total force structure. Okay, we also reduced the conventional. So we've ended up with something that is nothing like the array of nuclear capability that we envisaged during the Cold War as being appropriate to the United Kingdom. And I think it's, therefore, it's just misleading in terms of product description to describe the successor to Vanguard as like for like, and then it's very misleading in deterrent terms. If I can then deal with <coughs> some of the other things very quickly. Uh, David Ramsbart and I have spent our whole lives together in many happy incarnations, including arguing over the point about whether it's appropriate or not for the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Defense budget to carry the responsibility for the nuclear deterrent, which David just described its use as political. My view on this, which I have believed passionately, including when I was in the Ministry of Defense, is it's wholly appropriate that this should be on the Ministry of Defense's budget, and the Ministry of Defense should be forced to recognize the point that David was making, the opportunity cost of the choice that it makes. So the decision of the previous government to fudge this up and say, we'll have this thing, but it won't be at the expense of our conventional forces, for which Lord O'Donnell was responsible, was in my view, <laughs> just historically speaking, uh, was in my view quite the wrong thing to do for all sorts of reasons. And the position of the present government is the right position. It's a very awkward position because this is going to become a much more acute problem. The use of our nuclear weapons is political. The use of our conventional weapons is political. The judgments we make about the balance between them should be based on expert advice from inside uh, the Ministry of Defense. I absolutely agree about cyber, uh, but I don't think that, I don't think that this is a trade-off where uh, if we were to conclude that we should continue with our nuclear deterrent, we wouldn't also make uh, provision for cyber. But uh, David's absolutely right, and we should think about the cyber risks that are posed to our deterrent, actually, which I think is very interesting and obviously a very, very a sensitive subject. Um, on cruise missiles, I don't actually think that um, uh, the Americans would object. If there, were, if there were a cruise missile option, then certainly in the late 70s, when we looked very seriously at a cruise missile option, they didn't say to us, we really don't want you to do this because uh, it would have the point, uh, the complication that John Roper uh, drew attention to. Then, the elephant in the room, I think, is absolutely fundamental, uh, and Gus may have something to say about this. This is why prime ministers do not want to take the decision to be the person to give up our deterrent. 
because they worry that in 2050, when the history books come to be written, about what happened between now and 2050, something horrible, which is of a very low probability but a very high impact, will have happened and they will be, although probably dead, the person who goes down in history was responsible. Yeah. Um, okay, he got most of them, but I think there's a couple left, so go ahead, Gus. No, I was just, <clears throat> to agree with Richard, I think that legacy issue is a big one. I think trying to analyze these things, you, you, there was a reference to cyber. I absolutely passionately believe we should be spending a lot more on cyber. I think it's a massive risk to our, the important stuff, our economy. Um, and yeah. therefore, you know, by the way, it could also influence our defense, uh, which is quite important for our economy. So whichever way you look at it, the, the, there are big things here. Trying to say with these cost benefits, you'll come up with numbers is, is you know, they'll be, you know, they won't just be ranges, they'll be enormous ranges because there's an enormous uncertainty here. So again, it, it won't solve the problem. So I think there are some important things we need to do. And, and going back to that last question about the, how do you actually analyze what you really need? I think this, this strikes me as really interesting. I was very taken by, uh, they've released the Franks stuff now and uh, as she was then, Mrs. Thatcher's uh, comments about why, why didn't we prepare more for Falklands, and she said, we never thought they'd be so stupid. Mm -hmm. Now, if you mm -hmm. think about the analysis as you exactly. do for all of these things in terms of game theory and the like, mm -hmm. you kind of tend to have rational functions yeah. there. And we're in a world where, actually, is that the right way of analyzing these things? Again, I'd, I'd say to you, a lot of this is in the Mansky book, and about mm -hmm. it's all about creating um, dom you know, strategies which aren't dominated by any other strategy. But once you've done that, you're left with all sorts of undominated strategies and trying to choose between them is incredibly hard. But, but actually there are some things it can tell you are really dumb things to do. We probably are doing a few dumb things, not just winter fuel allowance. Um, so, Good. Um, any other comments or shall we move on to more questions? No, uh, Jeremy? Um, I think the point has to be made, I first agree with Gus that cyber has got to be addressed and we're way behind the curve of the offensive capability, but this is a, a general point. We can't just go on adding threats and paying for the defense for them without something dropping off the bottom. And here there is no distinction uh, in policy making, although there is in strategic warfare, between keeping going on Trident, keeping going on tanks and aircraft carriers and uh, certain types of fighter aircraft and bombers, etc., we've got to drop something off the bottom as we roll into the, the next era. We don't yet have the certainty that we can drop Trident off the bottom, uh, but we're approaching different circumstances, so we've got to debate it. But cyber has got to be dealt with or we're in trouble. On on cruise missiles, John, um, I think observers so far are saying that we can't, it, it would be more expensive to develop our own cruise missile, and the Americans are unlikely that they've divorced nuclear from cruise missiles. Um, I want to make a, a, a different point about the Brigadier's question, um, which is that the world is changing in such a way that the only way we can handle the whole range of threats is political. We've got to get international politics right or all sorts of things go wrong that are potentially existentially threatening to us. A uh, diplomat would make this point, but in uh, Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Kosovo to a certain extent, not in Sierra Leone, in Libya, in Mali. The West did military things without the political context, not just not being clear, but not being properly thought about. We are way below international global capability as an alliance, as, as a partnership with our European and North American partners in handling the politics of a rapidly changing world and if we divest in that and keep trident, we are doing ourselves a great deal of harm. Just a very short one on cyber. I think I'm right in saying, but Gus will correct me if I'm wrong, the government uh, has allotted 650 million mm -hmm. to cyber. I don't think <coughs> most of that is on the defense budget. 
is it? Some it's, of it is. Some of it is. Some of it is, yeah. yes. But uh, I, although mm -hmm. I happen to agree with Richard Mottram about nuclear mm -hmm. and conventional being entirely on the defence budget, I do think that's right. I think it would be a great mistake if cyber became a purely defence oh, yeah, budget issue, and I don't think it will. It's not. It's not. So I think that uh, uh, obviously the country has to face up to cyber, it's probably not doing as much as it should do now, but I think that will have to be a central government function, and the allocation of the costs of that will have to not come simply on the Ministry of Defence. Thank you. Um, we're, we're running out of time. I'm not going to be able to call on everybody who I acknowledged I would call on, so uh, I, I apologize for that. I'm going to take four or five. There was a gentleman in the far back mm -hmm. who, I, who I noted. I can't even remember who it was. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody who I, who I nodded to who was there? Um, or was it, a, was it a lady? I'm sorry, it was the lady? I'm sorry, it was Patricia Lewis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, um, and then I think next to her, is that somebody who looks like Kat Barton? Um, and then um, we'll take uh, um, Rebecca Johnson uh, and Nick uh, Ritchie, and we'll, I think we might have to cut it there. Try to make your, your, your questions uh, brief. Patricia. Thanks, Mark. I'm, I'm uh, delighted to be called. Uh, <laughs> is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, just very quickly, uh, first of all, plea for accuracy. Thank you all very much. Um, but it's really important, I think, that we uh, remember that these are called nuclear weapons, not the deterrent. And nuclear weapons are what they are. Deterrent is what it's believed by some that they do. And there are many things that deter, so it doesn't seem fair to just call it the deterrent. But my question is really is about the longevity of all of this and sustainability. You know, for how long would we, would people who advocate uh, replacing Trident imagine that Britain would want to keep its nuclear weapons? For, you know, where, where's that point at which Article 6 would be fulfilled? And in the meantime, how do we persuade others not to go down the same route? I think working in the international arena for so long, that's the hardest thing. How do we keep saying do as we uh, say rather than as we do? It's always the difficulty. And now, okay. Um, Kat Barton from the Acronym Institute for Disarmament Diplomacy. Um, I was just going to make a couple of comments, um, one of which is that uh, we hear a lot in this debate about you can't predict the future. Now, um, Nick Ritchie, I think he's going to, uh, going to speak himself, so I won't go over what he said at his book launch yesterday, but he did point out that there are sort of three possible nuclear futures, and I think it's just important <coughs> to recognise that you know, there's what he called um, stable, high salience nuclear future, um, which I think proponents of the status quo would hope that that would continue. Um, there's also an unstable, um, high salience nuclear future, which I think on the current trajectory is more likely. And the other nuclear future, I, I hope I'm not saying what you are, are going to say, Nick, um, is, that, is the progressive delegitimization of nuclear weapons, which, um, to me is the only sustainable route. Um, so I think we need to recognize the real reality of those potential futures when we're having this discussion. The second observation um, is really that there's been a lot of discussion here about the implications of relationships with the US, with NATO, with France. But I'd just like to point up that you know, there's a lot of other nations in the world and um, we need to be considering what the implications are of our relations with them. Now, this is particularly interesting to me because I was in Oslo last week where the um, humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons were being discussed and two-thirds of UN member states were there. So I'll wrap up now really just by saying, you know, these countries are discussing these matters and they have a stake in this as well. So um, if there is a process, which some of them hope ne Mexico is hosting the next conference later this year, if there, is a conf if there is a process to ban nuclear weapons, then what are the implications, should Trident replacement go ahead in whatever form, then what are the implications of our relations with those other countries? So that's a question for, for all panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca? Thank you. Uh, we seem to be getting uh, a few questions from the women at the back at the, uh, this point of the meeting. Uh, I also was at Oslo where there were two days of civil society discussions, which I have to say were really examining questions about deterrence. I have to endorse Patricia's point that calling it a nuclear, calling a weapon a nuclear, uh, you know, a deterrent 
is, is very muddled thinking because we have to examine whether this tool does the deterrence job better than other kinds of tools because there are many, many governments who, who, who rely on security and deterrence and I haven't heard much about security in this debate without it uh, being assigned as a property and I heard somebody even speak about the deterrence capacity being less if Trident Light was chosen as if deterrence and explosive capacity are the same things, they're not. But the interesting things about the discussions two days of civil society and then 127 governments uh, in, in a conference on humanitarian impact is, one, they spoke about weapons. They did speak about cyber, but they spoke about cyber in terms of security threats, including increasing the, the risks of uh, detonation by accident and so on. Uh, they also talked about the consequences for countries way outside of an area where a nuclear weapon might be detonated or multiple detonations, whether Europe or South Asia or anywhere else, might take place. So they were really thinking through, and they also talked a lot about how to strengthen the non-proliferation regime and what needed to be done to fulfill its actual objectives in terms of their security as non-nuclear countries. Now, this is the elephant in the, you know, we've heard a lot about a lot of elephants in the room. This is one that really, I think, the, the panel have not been waking up to. There's a different discourse going on within <coughs> which the UK decisions around what we do for our security, our defense, and our deterrence, nuclear or non-nuclear, are going to have to take place, and we need to really understand what changes that might make for those. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Nick Ritchie, somebody already spoke for you, but uh, I said I would call on you, so I call on you for the Thank last uh, question, and I really apologize to others I couldn't get to. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be brief. Nick Ritchie, University of, of York. Um, the discussion on, on the foreign policy implications of Trident mm. has focused on what we think other states may think about us but I think it's more perhaps primarily about how we think about ourselves. We, we've seen in, in Whitehall narratives on Trident over the last couple of, of years a strong, a powerful correlation between being a pivotal power, to use Blair's phrase, and being a nuclear weapon state, such that consideration of getting out of the nuclear weapons business challenges in some fundamental ways that national identity. And that's part of the reason why it's difficult for perhaps the broader political and defense establishment to think about Britain being a non-nuclear weapon state. So I'd appreciate the panel's views on, on that. And, and just one last comment, if I may, on, on like-for-like -like replacement. It, it strikes me that if now we have uh, four ballistic missile submarines armed with D-5 missiles with up to 40 hundred kiloton warheads operating under CAS-D, and in a successor system we have four ballistic missile submarines with D-5 missiles with up to 40 warheads operating under CAS-D, then that constitutes a like-for-like -like replacement of what we're doing now. Okay, thank you, Nick. So those uh, four questions are all um, similarly, um, I think, grouped, and uh, we don't have to discuss all of them. We, we are running out of time, but uh, each of you have uh, an opportunity now for a final uh, comment to address the questions or anything else that was left unsaid. Um, why don't we start with the order in which we, uh, we, we started? Um, okay, so some very quick comments, because there's, there's a very wide range in those questions. Um, obviously, Patricia, with the, the longevity of all of this is, is, is in the lap of the gods. You know, we, we can't see six months ahead, uh, but we're used to certain ways of thinking. Um, we haven't brought into this discussion the fact that NATO is going to struggle to have a political rationale to continue into the future as, as Europe and, and North America um, widen the Atlantic as their societies go in slightly different directions. All, all sorts of things are going to evolve as the world becomes more polarized and we become more nationalistic. The old institutions do not last forever in a long period of peace. That's why wars occur. And that's why I focused on politics in, in my last answer. Um, in in, in the, the what kind of nuclear future uh, question, and what, what implications if nuclear weapons are banned and Trident is renewed, 
here the whole nuclear, uh, the, the whole non-proliferation argument in which we're leaders is absolutely vital in the rolling negotiation of what is responsible in international politics and international conflict resolution. And we, we must, I hope we will, uh, keep a leading position in the non-proliferation argument. Even if it's a long journey we never want to arrive at Article 6, but we must keep our leadership up there. And the negotiation is about the deterrent working at the lowest uh, holding of, of nuclear weapons. Why call it a deterrent? Because deterrence wraps up the responsibility of nuclear weapon states not to use them. The deterrent philosophy is the responsible philosophy, and that's why we use that, that terminology. And Nick Rich's question about what do we think about ourselves, well, that's interesting, because if uh, I learned anything about the politics of the Iraq story, it was that the prime minister went in the hard direction, and the British people went in the soft direction. And I think that divide is actually increasing. Public opinion is not where government instincts are, and that's going to be a political problem for the whole Trident issue. Thank you, Sir Jeremy. David? Yeah, on the, that issue of um, our own self-image and so on, uh, I've been thinking for a couple of minutes about uh, Nick Rich's uh, point, and I'd only say up to a point. Uh, it isn't much good having a self-image which bears absolutely no relation to reality uh, or to the views of the other countries in the world with whom you have to treat. Uh, now, I would say that President Putin has a self-image which is rather a long way away from reality. And I don't think, over time, that it's going to do Russia much good that its president, uh, perhaps for the next eight, ten years or something, uh, is somebody who is... Uh, bathing in post-imperial nostalgia. So I, I think one should be cautious about that. I think you always have to test your own self-image against other people's image of you. And so if the gap gets too wide, it's not a, a very good thing. Then uh, the, the arguments at the back uh, from Rebecca and, and, and others, I do think that we've had this argument quite often um, in the past, that you overstate the importance of the United Kingdom in all this. Naturally enough, you do, because you're British, as mm -hmm. am I. Mm -hmm. But you overstate it. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody else in the world knows mm -hmm. that among the nuclear weapon states, we are the smallest arsenal. They also know that we are moving down the ladder, have been consistently moving down the ladder for many years, and that we will continue to move down the ladder as the multilateral agenda develops. So we are of great value to them as a nuclear weapon state, but one which is genuinely committed to moving down the ladder. But having said that, we really shouldn't exaggerate. If we stepped off the ladder, we would cease to be of much interest to any of them in about 10 minutes, I suspect. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I really don't think we should overstate our own role. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see, who is next? Gus? We, well, I'll let Richard. You, okay, go ahead. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, like I'll, like I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, I actually <coughs> have sympathy for the point that Patricia was making about um, the importance of accuracy in relation to um, nuclear weapons and so on. Um, so, insofar as I fell into the trap of uh, implied arguments that might be contestable, I, I confess and I apologise. I also agree, actually, that... Um, subject to the very important point that David made, that we should see um, uh, the world as others see it, including very significant um, other countries that we perhaps, did, for reasons of time, we didn't have um, the opportunity to talk about. And, and then, uh, finally, on like for like, uh, I wish I'd have erased it, uh, it's, the <laughs> argument that says, it's the argument that says Cold War relic, you had it in the Cold War, that was what it was about, it, in relation to Russia, and now you're going to do the same thing. It's that like for like. I absolutely agree, um, and I don't think any of the panel have said this, actually, uh, so we're not open to this criticism. I absolutely agree that uh, the way in which British politicians describe 
A, the role of the United Kingdom internationally, our global leadership role and all these sorts of things, and B, the role of nuclear weapons in relation to our global leadership role, both of those sets of propositions are, in my view, wrong-headed. And you will not find me, uh, I think, saying them. I spent my whole recent life saying, delete the word global and the word leadership in relation to the UK wherever you find it. That's not an argument that I was putting forward in relation to the issues we were discussing today. Thank you very much. Um, Gus, I think you have the last word. Just one thing I'd add in the light of the, there were mostly comments there that uh, I, I completely agree about the need to put this within an international context. And if you think about British influence, however big or small you might think it will be, I think there are lots of things we can do internationally which are important. Uh, the nuclear side to me doesn't hit my top five, to be honest. Um, there are lots more important things, actually. Well, thank you. Um, before I ask you to join me in thanking the panelists, I have a couple of housekeeping uh, announcements. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope you, uh, those of you who are here for the first time this calendar year, appreciate uh, the remodeling. Um, we will be trying to capture the essence of this discussion in a written report, and when I say we, I mean um, my very capable new uh, research analyst, Jenny Nielsen, uh, in the back, uh, with the help of uh, Carol um, Naughton. Um, and I would like to announce that the next two of uh, IISS discussion meetings um, are as follows. Next Tuesday, Graham Allison uh, will be speaking on the future of China, the rise of Asia, and the implications of the global balance of power. And then the following week, um, uh, former South Korean National Security Advisor, Ambassador Chun Young Woo, will be um, speaking about the North Korean paradox. Um, I will be chairing the second of those, and I promise that for the six of you who I should have called on today, you'll get first in line at that meeting if you should come. Join me now, please, in thanking the panelists and yourselves for a very enlightening discussion.